mentoring will not save a student who does not have the appropriate amount of talent to make it. You can't just say, I'm going to mentor everybody, and we're going to have 100% successes. Okay? I gave a talk at Berkeley, and they said, what's your retention rate against your minority students that you have? And I said, our retention rate's about 85 to 90%. Undergraduate, it's 90. Graduate, it's about 85 to 90 through PhD. And they just got up and said, that's, that's no good. That's too high. It's got to be lower than 50. I mean, you're producing bad people. You can't do that. Okay? And our retention rate is 50%. And anybody does that better than 50% is not doing the right thing. But we accept the people we know are going to make it. And then we make sure that they do it. It's like medical school. Medical school is accept people that are going to make it. And then you get through. So I want a retention rate of 90%. Our underrepresented minority and, ma and majority retention rates are the same, graduate and undergraduate. Okay. So, so that, I mean, that's, that's success. But that was foreign to Berkeley. That was very foreign. Okay. They didn't understand how we could retain so many and still keep a quality program. Okay, so mentoring will save many who today fall through the cracks, who do have the talents and should have the degree. So you can't save 100%, and you can't go in and just say, let's take everybody, and we're going to succeed with it. There's a big pool out there. And oftentimes, I say we succeed with what I call a second pool. The second pool are the minority graduate students that come to Rice who were not accepted by Berkeley or Stanford or MIT <laughs> or Princeton. It's that pool who will make it, who show great talent in many ways, but aren't going off to Stanford and Berkeley. So if I say anything that our success has been by working with that second pool, they're good. But I also say that I was a member of the second pool when I was an undergraduate student. We'll talk more about that. So let's go over here. Okay, so uh, um, Antonio did a good job of these things. So I don't have to really spend a lot of time on them. And um, so I won't. But you know, the, the naive optimist, the supply of scientists, engineers, and mathematicians and the health of the science and engineering profession will be maintained by turning the country's underrepresented group. That's what our politicians, that's what people have been saying for years. Next. Um, the truth is that the health of the science, engineering, and mathematic profession will be maintained by turning to across the seas. It's always been, you know, it's not a bad solution, it's a good solution. Although, as Antonio pointed out, we can't depend on it anymore. If you look at, you know, he was talking about the science and engineering indicators. And, and you, if you look at the graphs of the PhDs and the graduate education in, uh, among you know, Asian countries, it's incredible. I mean, we're gonna, we, don't, we can't keep looking for this solution of importation. One of the things that uh, I say, no first world nation can maintain its economic health when such a large part of its population is outside mainstream activity, including all technological, scientific, and computational activity. So, next transfer. Okay. So here's the me my message. Underrepresentation endangers the health of the nation. It isn't the health of the profession. Although I accept your point that essentially we have different dimensions and it certainly has made a difference in medicine. In mathematics, mathematics is not going to fall okay, because there's no women or there's no blacks or there's no Hispanics. It's going to go on. So it isn't that we're arguing, let's save the health of the discipline. It's that we're arguing, let's save the health of the nation. We can't create a permanent underclass that are outside our national mainstream activity, which is information technology and other things. So if we're not represented there, then we're going to have a permanent underclass. Okay. Um, these things you all know. I mean, you know, value added, economic and societal health, broader understanding to the table in our more global economy. Now this is important. Facilitate a smoother transition from research university to reality. The minority students that I work with, um, they understand both sides, and they do a really good job of becoming leaders. We're going to get back into leadership. Leadership is a critical thing. Next. OK, here's a key point. Retention is far more critical than admissions. And I've already touched on that. That's Michigan, Caltech. So here's, here's the crying thing, the loss of the precious few. So we take those who made it through our K-12 system, who did a really good job, and now they're going to science and engineering at undergraduate level. And at undergraduate level, as Antonio mentioned earlier today, we drive them away from the science and the engineering, and they go major not in law and medicine or pre-law and pre-medicine. 
in things in which they allows them to keep and maintain self-esteem. Political science, sociology, history. And they should have been produced as scientists, but they couldn't maintain their self-esteem because we, as undergraduate schools, didn't know how to help them do it. So they leave. And it is, once I gave this talk and, I, and somebody said, oh, but we need more minorities in sociology. Indeed we do. But we don't need the ones who started out in engineering. And if you look at the, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Another issue that would be, I mean, faculty hiring, this was also one of your points, is by far the most problematic. Faculty hiring, in fact, I think Antonio's answer on this one was really, really good. We have traditional evaluation. And traditional evaluation says, sure, you've got four letters from Nobel laureates and you came from MIT and you did this thing, that's a good hire. The dimensions that often come in so strong, um, mentoring, development of programs, working with students, guiding, the things that I do so well. I was not the first choice when I was interviewed at Rice. I was the second choice, and I know the first choice. The first choice went on to a very undistinguished career someplace else, okay? Mary Wheeler, Ken Kennedy, who have become quite successful in their careers, they also weren't first choices. And they went, and in fact, they, they, they say, Richard, tell them people, I was not the first choice, okay? They're all we're all National Academy, okay? yet we weren't first choices. So traditional evaluation doesn't take bad people in. It isn't so much that I would say, you know, it's a type one and type two or the alpha and the beta error in statistics. It isn't that traditional evaluation takes in bad people. It's that it excludes a lot of very, very good people. And a lot of very good people who would give in many dimensions. I never doubted that I would do things like win teaching awards and win research awards and win mentoring awards. I mean, other people doubted it, but I never doubted it, okay? Next one. <coughs> well, let's talk about mentoring. I don't think too much about it. You must develop the style that is best for you. I will share with you my style and maybe you can pick up some things. I did what I was taught at home. I did not study to be a mentor. I studied to be a caring person. My father is caring, my mother is caring, my father in particular. And so I learned to reach for people. So this cross-cultural and cross-gender, my initial success at Rice came with improving the representation of women. And see, women, it's, it's, it's easier to deal with women than it is with underrepresented women. Because women are educated in parallel worlds. It isn't that, you know, and even though the women's colleges are very good. So it isn't that essentially you say, well, you came from Yates or Milby and you came from Bel Air, which is a really good school. Women are educated in parallel worlds. So, we started to do things when I was chair at Rice, and we've been running 50% women PhDs in our program for the last 10 to 15 years. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now, did we have women faculty? Yes. Did they want to do it? No. Did I want to do it? Yes. Who did it? I did. Now, if you ask me right now, am I more effective with Hispanics than with African Americans? I mean, right now I have two African American students. The answer is probably, Maybe, maybe not. And it's because at the level of where I have to guide them, it isn't fine tuning. It isn't that I have to go in and understand the subtle aspects of a particular society or culture. I just have to get them through. I have to deal with failing an exam, failing a test, motivation, and stuff like that. In that level, I don't have to fine tune black versus brown versus red versus women. To me, everybody's the same. You need help and I can help you. Then come on in. Donald uh, Williams, who's one of my PhD students right now, he told me, Dr. Tapia, I was always told when I grew up that no one who was black would ever help me. But you and your wife have shown me how wrong I am, how wrong my parents were. So he goes back to Dallas and he says, Mom, you were wrong. And my wife being Puerto Rican, she hugs him all the time. And so he went back and he hugged his mother and he gave her a kiss on the cheek. And she said, Donald, we didn't grow up doing that. Where did you learn that? And he said, I learned that from Mrs. Tapia. She's Puerto Rican. She hugs and gives everybody a kiss, okay? So here, uh, my students, of course they have to do that. Because if they come into my house, my wife will always say, give me a hug and give me a kiss. And so you can impact just all the students at the level we're talking about. Granted, there's some fine tuning that needs, you know, a little bit of, say, difference in gender, difference. But we're not dealing with that right now. We're not dealing with that, okay? Um, all right, let's see what's up next, okay? So, so these are the things that make me me. My father, 
a strong sense of inclusiveness and sense of community. I really learned that from my father. He knew everybody. He knew everybody in the neighborhood. He knew everybody in the restaurants. He knew everything. And everybody was at our house. Okay? My mother, si se puede. Yes, you can do it. You know, my mother was born in Mexico. My father was born in Mexico. They came here as 10-year-olds without parents, by themselves. And neither one graduated from high school because life was too tough. But there's five of us. And we all have college degrees. Four have graduate degrees. Albeit, as I mentioned before, two are lawyers. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, my mother taught me global standards. Global standards and extreme pride. So as I grew up, confidence and strength. She'd say, I grew up in Los Angeles, where Mexican was always derogatory. Anything you want to cut, it was use the word, the adjective Mexican. So one of the statements that was made earlier about we get put down more often than we get put up is correct. And so I tell my mom, you want me to be proud, but they won't let me. And she said, well, you just have to endure. She said, people don't want me to be proud. In fact, they don't like when I'm proud, and they don't like when I'm confident. Okay? My education. I was certainly smart. I won no honors, had no good counseling. I did not go to college out of high school. Okay? My twin brother Bobby and I, we set world records in 1968. My brother was just inducted into the Drag Racing Hall of Fame mm -hmm. last year. So we, we know our love was cars. From high school, I went to work, which I knew that um, that wasn't going to be what I wanted to do. Uh, it was, I enjoyed it, but it basically I had to go to college. So I went to community college. Community college was the best thing I ever did. There I had confidence. I had extreme confidence. I was a star. I was a star. Okay? And I had two people, both white males, tell me, you're going to UCLA. I said, I am? I am. Okay, I am. Where is it? Okay, let's go. Okay, and they said you're going to go to UCLA. Let's go. Okay, they just picked me up, and I was the best in the class, and I had confidence, and I, you know I needed that when I, when I got to UCLA because I wasn't the best anymore, and it was hard. So I learned how to survive, and at UCLA I survived. When everybody was taking maybe 18 hours, I'd take 12 or whatever it had to be, but I survived, and uh, so th that's basically the community college was really something. I was great. Now, UCLA, I was a straight B student. No C's, no A's. No, I got one A. Okay, I got one A. Okay. <laughs> Next. So now, on the other hand, going into graduate school at UCLA, see, happiness is a monotone increasing function. Okay? Unhappiness is monotone decreasing. So I've always been monotone increasing. I get better every year. Okay? <laughs> and so in graduate school, I was pretty damn good. By that time, I was, I was good. And so, I went to Wisconsin to the uh, Mathematics Research Center at the University of Wisconsin, and because Dave Sanchez, who was on the faculty, and says, Tapia, you're going to Wisconsin. And I said, okay. And I went. And um, it, was a, it was the next best thing that happened to me. Okay. There I met the world's best people. I started writing papers with people that I had only heard of and stuff. And I wrote a bunch of papers, and I did really, really well. And so going from UCLA to Wisconsin to the Math Research Center was outstanding for me. It was just, I just was well connected. From then on, I had passed the initial filter, and they said, oh, you went to Math Research Center, you must be good, okay? Uh, my wife and children. So G Jean um, married, uh, we got married when uh, I was a sophomore. Jean was 17, I was 19. Jean is New Yorkan. Uh, her parents are from Puerto Rico. She was born in New York. They had a daughter, at, <laughs> okay? We had, uh, uh, when we got married, when I was a sophomore, I had a daughter, Cersei. Then when I got a PhD, I had Richard, and we had Becky. And they're all very, very different, all three. I've gone through a lot of adversity. Cersei was killed in 1982. She was a Rice student. She was a sophomore. She was killed in an automobile accident, okay? Jean, who grew up as a dancer,